Our nation was founded on the fundamental principle that all people should have the freedom to live, to worship, and to be without fear of violence or persecution. Every person has the right to live safe from violence, hate, and bigotry. And for those reasons and so many more, President Joe Biden and I have a duty, not only to keep the people of our nation safe, but to condemn unequivocally and forcefully all forms of hate. And so today, I am proud to announce the Biden-Harris administration will develop our nation's first national strategy to counter Islamophobia. Welcome to Disaffected. I'm Joshua Slocum coming to you from Dystopian, Burlington, Vermont. And this is the show where we talk about politics, culture, and relationships through a psychological lens. In speaking of dystopian Burlington, Vermont, as I drove into the studio today to make this show, a great example was right there on Pearl Street, one of our main drags. Approximately 30 to 40 dirty, and I mean physically dirty, didn't, don't wash hair, don't wash clothes, UVM students, University of Vermont students, carrying pro-Palestine banners, flags, and signs. One of them was Jews Against Genocide. There were lots of free Palestine. I didn't see any from the river to the sea, uh, but I'm sure that we will hear that on the bullhorns that they were carrying with them, and as they did during the George Floyd riots. Uh, they have designated a young man who apparently believes that he has police power to stand in the middle of four-way signaled intersections and direct traffic. No police presence because when you are woke in Burlington, you can do whatever you want. And among those 30 or 40 students, about 25% of them were fully COVID masked. And, and I don't just mean little surgical masks. I mean the modern plague doctor masks, the big black cone that comes out. And those who didn't have the big black cone had Palestinian scarves across their faces. I hate this city. The only reason I ever come into this city now is to make this show. So we brought you in with a clip of Vice President Kamala Harris talking about Islamophobia. Let's let her finish her thoughts. Since we took office, President Biden and I have fought to uphold that duty. Over the past decade, America has seen a rise in attacks on houses of worship. So in response, we expanded funding to protect houses of worship from violence. After a surge in hate during the pandemic, in particular anti-Asian hate, President Biden signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act to improve the reporting of hate crimes and to ensure hate crimes are investigated quickly and thoroughly. Earlier this year, in response to an historic rise in anti-Semitic attacks, we also released the first national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. And to make clear, taking on hate is a national priority. President Biden and I held the first White House summit to address hate-fueled violence and we brought together religious leaders, community leaders, and survivors to continue our work to keep all Americans safe. And today, we take another important step forward in our fight against hate. For years, Muslims in America and those perceived to be Muslim have endured a disproportionate number of hate-fueled attacks. As a result of the Hamas terrorist attack in Israel and the humanitarian crisis in Gaza, we have seen an uptick in anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab, anti-Semitic, and Islamophobic incidents across America, including the brutal attack of a Palestinian-American woman who is Muslim and the killing of her six-year-old son. A senseless act of violence that the Department of Justice is investigating as a hate crime for so many people in our nation, the past few days and weeks have brought about all too familiar fears. Fears that they will be targeted, profiled, or attacked. 
simply because of who they are, how they worship, or how they look. And so today, I am proud to announce the Biden-Harris administration will develop our nation's first national strategy to counter Islamophobia. This strategy will be a comprehensive and detailed plan to protect Muslims and those perceived to be Muslim from hate, bigotry, and violence, and to address the concern that some government policies may discriminate against Muslims. For example, the so-called Muslim ban, which President Biden revoked on our first day in office. So here's the bottom line. In America, no one should be made to fight hate alone. And in this moment, then, let us all clearly say, a harm against any one of us is a harm against all of us. Yes, mommy dearest. I don't know who disgusts me more, that woman or Hillary Clinton. They're both sociopaths. We're going to talk about form and substance. Let's talk first about form. Did you notice the Hollywood camera work that was going on here? This is ostensibly an address to the nation from the vice president. Up until modern times, real recently, you just got a straight camera shot, like you're getting with me right now, just, just a full frontal camera shot. That's not what you get now. You get fully produced cinematic, well, they would call it content. Um, multiple camera and no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back even further. This may be, uh, some of you will notice this, some of you won't. Um, I'm a former film student, so I do notice these things. They're shooting in 24 frames per second. Generally, regular video is, is 30 frames a second. It's one of the things that makes soap operas look like what they do versus uh, motion pictures, at least in the film era. Uh, that frame rate difference gives, gives a different sense of motion. We associate 24 frames a second with the cinematic look. That's what they're doing. Why? Why do we need to go from looking straight at Kamala Harris's face to a three-quarter profile where she's not even looking at the camera? What is the purpose of that? Is it to feature her? Is it to flatter her physical appearance? Is it to create a mood and atmosphere? Yes, that's what it is, to create a mood and atmosphere. This is a major motion picture event, isn't it? It's not just a press briefing. It's not a statement to the American people. It is a media event. They have a goddamn studio in the White House, a studio set in the White House of the White House. We've seen Joe Biden in it. It's a mock-up of the Oval Office with a projected background that makes it look like the Rose Garden is right outside the window. It's a Russian nesting doll of fakery. She's probably sitting on a set right now. That's probably not even a room in the White House. It's probably a copy of the room inside the White House. All right. I was going to say we were talking about form and substance. Really, the form is the substance. The medium is the message here, is it not? Because all of this is fake. Rise in anti-Asian hate during the pandemic. That never happened. People like her and people on the left started screaming because Trump called it the China virus and people called it the Wuhan virus, which it was. It was anti-Asian hate. Hate, hate, no place for hate, hate crimes, hate, hate, hate. <laughs> It seems to me these past few weeks since October 7th, when Hamas attacked Israel, and I remind everybody that their opening move was to paraglide over the border into a music festival full of hundreds of young men and women, college-age kids, and murder them in cold blood while they filmed it for social media, civilians. And then there were the rapes, and then there was the parading around of broken and twisted young women's bodies in the back of pickup trucks with those bearded psychopathic motherfuckers. And in that time since that happened, we've seen a huge explosion, 
no, not an explosion, a huge revealing of anti-Jewish bigotry across the West to a degree that genuinely shocked and surprised me. I was wrong. I did not believe that anti-Jewish sentiment was as widespread as it clearly is. That's why I stopped myself from saying uh, an explosion of, this wasn't an explosion of, this wasn't something new. We, we, this was a reveal. I, I had miscalculated public sentiment very badly. And what do we get from the White House? The first national strategy to counter not anti-Jewish bigotry, not Nazi sentiment, not to counter anti-Semitism, but to stop Islamophobia. Islamophobia. Now, you see, the reversals are coming immediately. Here is a statement from White House Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre. On President Biden's establishment of the first ever national strategy to counter Islamophobia. Now, before we go on to the quotes, um, the reversals are coming immediately now. Recognize this as an escalation. This is an escalation of tactics. They're not giving us a spoonful of sugar to get the medicine down. They're not waiting a, a plausible amount of time to slip it in. They're just doing it immediately. We see huge anti-Jewish sentiment, disgusting insults that sound like something directly out of the Third Reich all over the country in the United States. Everyone sees it. Whether you approve of it or not, everyone sees it. And what do we get? Islamophobia, 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 Islamophobia. Please recognize this. Please see this psychopathic reversal. They are so brazen and so bold now, they don't even, they're, they're correct. They're not even doing plausible deniability. They're not slipping it in. They're not lubricating us in any way. They're just going in dry and hard right away. This is an escalation. It's getting quicker. Look sharp. So let's, let's hear what the White House has to say about the problem of Islamophobia. Quote, President Biden ran for office to restore the soul of our nation. He is unequivocal. There is no place for hate in America against anyone, period. Corrine, shut your fucking mouth. I'm sick of listening to this. I'm so sick of this tone of voice, this tone. Let me be clear. Let me be unequivocal. There is no place for, period. Shut up. <laughs> I've asked this so many times before. Do you like being spoken to that way? Do you think that it is appropriate for that glib, stupid young woman who is the White House press secretary to talk to the American people that way? I remember being spoken that way, spoken to that way by my grammar school teachers when it was appropriate. Right. Let's keep going with the press release. Quote, today, he and Vice President Harris are announcing that their administration will develop the first ever U.S. national strategy to counter Islamophobia in the United States. We look forward to continuing our work with community leaders, advocates, members of Congress, and more to develop the strategy, which will be a joint effort led by the Domestic Policy Council and the National Security Council, and counter the scourge of Islamophobia and hate in all its forms. Countering hate. We're just getting it ahead in all its forms. 
I'm going through my notes here because I have things to say about hate. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I don't know if it's coming up or if I skipped over something I was going to tell you before. Oh. More from the press release. Quote, for too long, Muslims in No, let me stop there. I want, I want to point out um, Kamala's linguistic signaling, too. Do you notice the pronunciation? Muslims. I know it's small. I know. But it is a tell. It's, it's what NPR does. It's uh, linguistic signaling, linguistic uniforms. It's adopting a particular pronunciation of a word that becomes considered the official politically correct way to pronounce the word. It's very subtle because you're not going to stop your friend in the middle of a, a lunch conversation and say, why are you pronouncing the word that way when most people pronounce it this way? You're not going to do that. That's just not going to happen. So it's subtle, but it's effective. Muslims, Muslims. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the pronunciation. I'm just saying notice that you can sort people's political agendas by the way they pronounce words. Press release, quote, for too long, Muslims in America and those perceived to be Muslims such as Arabs and Sikhs have endured a disproportionate number of hate-fueled attacks and other discriminatory incidents. We all mourn the recent barbaric killi killing of Wadia al Fayume, a six year old Palestinian American Muslim boy, and the brutal attack on his mother in their home outside Chicago. End quote. Okay. Not true. There's no disproportionate rise in hate fueled attacks on Muslims, whatever that means. And I don't know what that means. What is a hate fueled attack? What makes that different from any other attack? A love fueled attack, perhaps? Is that why we have alleged hate crimes? Because those are worse than love crimes or indifference crimes? Where's the data? What disproportionate rise, what specifically does a hate-fueled attack consist of? Give me details, not using any of the words hate-fueled attack. You must define the words, you may not use the words to define them. And in the quote below, the next quote I'm going to give you, I want you to notice the bad grammar. This is what I, this is what I mean when I make fun of that, um, that ramen noodle haired um, freak who stands up at the lectern and speaks for Vice President Joe Biden. This is the millennial generation and their lack of education and their linguistic and it's beyond awkwardness. It's almost a disability. It's almost a literacy disability. Listen to this. Quote, today's announcement is the latest step as part of Biden, President Biden's directive. Yes, I'm going to harp on this. I'm going to read it to you again. Today's announcement is the latest step as part of President Biden's directive. What the hell is that? The latest step as part of? That's not how, that's not how English works. These, this is the White House. <laughs> All right. The latest step is part of President Biden's directive last year to establish an interagency group to increase and better coordinate the U.S. government efforts to counter Islamophobia, anti-Semitism, and related forms of bias and discrimination within the United States, end quote. No, I do not accept that. That word anti-Semitism was simply slipped in there as a tiny, tiny little nod to plausible deniability. No, it did not make this a balanced statement. No, it does not take away from the fact that this is gaslighting. We are being told that Muslims in America are in danger and, it's, and we need to get on top of Islamophobia. I don't accept the existence of Islamophobia any more than I accept the existence of transphobia. Those are fake concepts. People who dislike trans people or people who dislike Muslims cannot be fairly described in general as having a psychologically diagnosable irrational fear. Some people, sure, yeah. I, I'm going to say the same thing about homophobia. It's just as much of a bullshit term. I wish I hadn't used it for as many years in my life as I did. There is anti-gay bigotry. 
Um, there are anti-gay sentiments. People are allowed to have anti-gay sentiments. People are allowed to dislike homosexuals. They're allowed to not trust me because I'm gay. I don't have to like that. They are allowed to do that. It is not my business to tell them that they can't do it. People are allowed to dislike Muslims. And to the extent that anyone is actually fearful of Islam right now, I think they have some pretty damn justifiable reasons to be so, don't they? Yeah. Phobia. Next quote. <laughs> Uh, I won't do the voice, but I want to. Quote, moving forward, the president, vice president, and our entire administration will continue working to ensure every American has the freedom to live their lives in safety and without fear for how they pray, what they believe, and who they are. Oh, that's lovely. All right. Hate is not illegal. Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, any of you listening on the left, hate is is not illegal. Emotions are not illegal. The government has no business talking to us about hate, let alone lecturing us about our feelings. It is no business of government to govern your emotions. We're going to speak out forcefully against hate. Are you, Mommy? How? Tell me what kind of force you're going to use. Because I'm going to push back just as forcefully. No, harder. Because that is how you stop bullies tit for tat. You hit me, I'm going to hit you back, not proportionally, I'm going to hit you harder. You bite me, I'm going to bite you and draw blood. That's how I play. That's how you win. That's how you stop people who are trying to hurt you. You scare them. All these lies about anti-Asian hate and, and so-called hate crimes, which doesn't even actually exist in American legal jurisprudence, even though we have state laws that refer to hate crimes. They're unconstitutional. Think of it this way. Is it okay to hate Hitler? Is it okay to hate somebody who murdered your mother? Is it okay to hate serial killers? I'm not, no, I mean, if I had an audience here, I, I would actually be waiting and I would insist that the audience answer me. I'm asking you a question. You answer the question. Of course it is. We all know it is. Why do we accept this from the government? Characterizing political differences and legitimate fears and legitimate anger over the destruction of our culture and our legal norms and our etiquette, legitimate anger. We allow them to tell us that we are hateful. This is a narcissistic reversal. This is, this is so cluster B, I can't even, it, it, it's, it's just, it's entirely, it's entirely narcissistic. And at the very same time across the sea, we have London Mayor Sadiq Khan. <laughs> I'm not pretending anymore. I'm not pretending anymore, okay? The kind of people with foreign names and brown skin who are disproportionately elevated to positions of power at the head of Western governments are not the kind of people who are happily assimilating into American or British society. They are people who want to take it over. And I am not some kind of unreconstructed xenophobic troglodyte to point it out. I am not a bigot, but I am also not a fool or a patsy. And I suggest that you stop being a fool and a patsy, too. If you're afraid to say this stuff, you better say it while you can, because pretty soon, if this keeps going, you're not going to be allowed to. So, so we've got London Mayor Sadiq Khan, who has declared November a S Islamophobia Awareness Month in the United Kingdom. No, he well, you, you can't do it in the United Kingdom. He can only do it in London uh, <laughs> so far. While pro-Palestinian demonstrators are planning a million-person march on the UK's Remembrance Day, which is somewhat analogous to our American Memorial Day or Veterans Day. And it's National Islamophobia Awareness Month. Why? Why? 
Sadiq. Reversal, immediate psychopathic reversal. This is transnationally coordinated, obviously. They are all working from a script in Western governments. This is a cabal. I don't know exactly who it is. I don't know who's at the top. I don't know if it's the UN. I don't know if it's some shadow group. Um, I don't care if you are going to say conspiracy theory. Conspiracies happen all the time. We all, we all know that. This is, there's nothing kooky about this. It is clearly a transnationally coordinated messaging campaign. This should worry you. All of you, and I'm not speaking just to Americans here, I'm speaking to anyone who lives in the allegedly free West. This should scare you. So here we've got Mayor of London, uh, Sadiq Khan, on Twitter. Today marks the beginning of Islamophobia Awareness Month at a time when we're seeing rising hate crime toward a number of communities in our city, it has never been more important that we collectively condemn these vile and ignorant acts. Ugh. Can we get new writers down in the script department, please? This stuff is so stale. <laughs> Did you hire them all from RKO Studios? <laughs> then we have National Treasure. British national treasure Douglas Murray, who wrote, uh, among other books, The Strange Suicide of the West, prescient, saying this on Twitter, quote, UK Hamas supporters are now planning a million man march on Remembrance Day. They plan to defame our war dead and desecrate the cenotaph itself. This is the tipping point. If such a march goes ahead, then the people of, must, of Britain must come out and stop these barbarians. I do not care whether you agree with Douglas's sentiment or not. I'm not going to tell you what I think about it because it's irrelevant. What I want you to see is the reaction of a former BBC News presenter, also LBC News, Matthew Stadlin on Twitter, responded, might be worth you guys keeping an eye on this chap, Met Police UK. These are the London police. He tagged in the London police. This seems pretty close to inciting civil unrest. Oh, I, I have to do it, Matthew, you pussy, with your little question mark. This is how you write it. This seems pretty close to inciting civil unrest. He can't, he writes in upspeak. <laughs> They're not even embarrassed anymore. The press is your enemy. The media is your enemy. A national newscaster in Great Britain is tagging the Metropolitan Police in London to target author Douglas Murray to accuse him of inciting civil unrest because he's pissed off that allegedly a million pro-Palestinian people are going to clog the streets of London again. Have you looked at London lately? Have you looked at any of the news coverage? It has been Sidewalk to sidewalk full of hundreds of thousands of people screaming free Palestine, free Palestine. I'm not saying they shouldn't necessarily be allowed to do it, but don't act for a second like we have an Islamophobia problem. <laughs> do you see hundreds of thousands of people out there saying protect the Jews? No, you don't. The fact that a national news presenter feels comfortable trying to sick the police on a political opponent and another media figure should scare the pants off any sensible person. This is not normal. This never happened before recent years. This would never have happened even 10 years ago. Plot this stuff. If you have to get a notebook out and write this stuff down and date it, I suggest you do so. You need to see the progression, the, the regression of your society. It's real. You know, when I, the year, the year it, 2016, the, the hardest year of my life when I had, when I put my mother out of my life, when I sued her and I had to take her to court and evict her, when I was having a nervous breakdown, when I was waking up, to what was wrong with my family, what was wrong with my mother, what was wrong with the psychological abuse dynamic that we were all living in. 
I started writing things down that she would say. I saved her emails. I wrote down the things that she said to me on the phone. I timed them and I dated them. And thank God I did because she tried to gaslight me into saying I, I hallucinated what she said. And then I started self gaslighting because I've been doing that my whole life. I mean, I was raised that way. My mother taught me to do it to myself. And that stabilized me. I could see that right there contemporaneously, this, this really happened. She really did do this. She really did say that. She really did throw that frying pan. It was real. And I could see the progression. Document. You are living in history right now. Document it. If, if for no one else, then for your own sanity. So that when you think you're going crazy, you can go back and check yourself. Kevin and I were spent a long time talking about what we were going to talk about on the show, how we were going to talk about this political upheaval that's going on right now. What's the major theme? And it's about, for us, how do we set our moral compasses? It is obvious to us that anti-Jewish bigotry is being revealed and practiced all over the country, people are ripping down posters of kidnapped Israelis. They are verbally targeting Jews with Nazi slurs. Um, people online uh, who I never expected to hear it from. I mean, you know, that, not that I actually really know, you know, followers on Twitter, but they're they're people that I've I've seen what they write and they've they've spoken to me and I wouldn't have expected it. Have have called me Jew lover uh, or a nasty, dirty Jew, um, with pictures of Hitler. I've had more of this. I'm not sharing all of it with you on the show, but it continues. It's, it's very clear to me that that the major problem right now is, is directed at, at, at Jewish people. And well, here, I'll give you an example. Here, here's one from Twitter. Um, and I wrote, new insult just dropped. Yeah, that's me. So this person says to me, calls me another Jew supremacist thinking Jews are holy people. It is anti-Semitism to call out Jewish Nazism and supremacy, the irony. No, I don't understand it entirely. It doesn't hang together all the way, but it was, it was certainly, um, you know, an anti-Jewish insult against me. Um, I mean, you know, obvious, I'm not crying over it, but it's revealing. So your moral compass in, in, in figuring out how to react today, what you think about what's going on between Israel and Palestine. How far back in history are we morally obligated to go in order to set that moral compass? This is an open question. And Kevin and I talked about it last night a lot. And I think what we came to consensus on is uh, you don't have to go all the way back to the late 1940s and the creation of Israel and relitigate the entire history of the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis in order to answer some basic moral questions that are happening right now. You are not required to do that. God, your conception of God, I don't think your God requires you to do that. I don't think morality requires you to do that. Um, when you have terrorists, psychopathic Muslim extremist terrorists called Hamas, who are shooting civilians, killing parents in front of their children, raping women so badly that their pelvises are broken. I do not have to answer your questions about the history of Israel or the Yom Kippur War in order to say there's a clear moral divide here. That I even have to address this is, is outrageous. <laughs> outrageous. And being outraged at this psychopathic, animalistic, demonic brutality is not a statement that everything Israel has ever done or will ever do is perfect and they've never committed any crimes against Palestinians. It's just not. It's just not. So I have a question to, to, for you to contemplate. Those of you who say, like these stupid University of Vermont children. Jews against genocide. What genocide? What genocide against Palestinians? That is a serious word. Back it up. What genocide?
What would you have Israel do? When Hamas, as it has done forever, deliberately builds its headquarters among civilian domestic homes, when it embeds itself in hospitals, when it makes sure that its militants are quartered among civilians, families, women, and children. It does this deliberately because that is what psychopaths do, because they are taking advantage of normal people's morality, right? People don't want to send a rocket to kill women and children. They know that. They're taking advantage of normal human morality that they lack. What would you have Israel do? And if if you are going to comment on this, I can't, I can't stop you from leaving a comment. I can't make you hew to my rules. But if I choose to engage you and you don't answer my question, you're not going to have a good time in the comment section this week, okay? I'm not taking the shit. What would you have Israel do? Answer that specific question. How can they protect themselves and stop this if you say they can't retaliate because they're killing civilians and if they kill civilians, it's genocide? Why do I never hear accusations of genocide against Hamas going after Jews in Israel? Why? <laughs> Should they just sit there and take it? Take one for the team. Okay, kill my children. Thank you, daddy psychopath. Rape me harder. Break my pelvis harder. Gouge my children's eyes out harder. I don't want to hurt the other women on your side. I'll just take it. Hmm. No. So what is actually going on in this country with regard to anti-Jewish sentiment? A lot of anti-Jewish sentiment, but it is more complicated than, than it appears on the surface. I'm going to give you a couple examples. This is Patrick Dye. He is a Cornell University junior. Remember that two weeks ago, we talked about Cornell professor Russell Rickford, who stood there. I, I was incorrect when I talked about that. I said he was in New York City. He was not. He was on the campus of Cornell in Ithaca. And he was screaming at the crowd that, with happiness that he said he was exhilarated. He was energized by the Hamas attack. Now we have Patrick Dye. Junior and something that Cornell calls a safety officer, I don't know exactly what that means, posted the following on social media. Quote, Jewish people need to be killed. If you see a Jewish, quote, person, yes, he put scare quotes around the word person. If you see a Jewish person on campus, follow them home and slit their throats. Rats need to be eliminated from Cornell, posted by Jew Evil. Next one, Israel, which he puts in scare quotes, Israel deserved October 7th. The genocidal fascist Zionist regime will be destroyed. Rape and kill all the Jew women before they birth more Jew Hitlers. Jews are excrement on the face of the earth. No Jew civilian is innocent of genocide posted by Hamas warrior. I'll give you a little background from the New York Post. Quote, the Cornell University student accused of making violent threats against his Jewish peers is 21-year-old engineering student who suffers from, quote, severe depression. <laughs> that his mother worried he was on the brink of suicide just months before his arrest. Patrick Dyer, Jr. at the prestigious university was arrested by federal authorities Tuesday for making a string of disturbing online posts over the weekend, threatening to kill and rape Jewish students and to bring an assault rifle to the campus. Investigators traced the deranged post, posts to Dye's IP address at his off-campus apartment, where he allegedly admitted to being the culprit, according to a federal complaint. Dye's parents, however, believe their son is innocent. Quote, My son is in severe depression. He cannot control his emotion well due to the depression. No, I don't think he committed the crime. End quote. His father, who asked that his name not be used, told the post in a text message. Why did you grant the father's request not to name him? It's not like I can't go find out who his father's name is. But I'd like, I'd like, I'd like to know. That's not normal journalistic practice either. Now, about a week ago, 
there was a story going around that a bunch of Jewish students had been uh, barricaded in a library at Cooper Union College in New York City by Hamas protesters. Um, I'm going to show you the video, um, and then we're going to complicate it because it's an example of some stuff that did not happen quite the way it was presented. Please roll that clip, Kevin. Thank you. Tense moments at Cooper Union College as a rally supporting the Palestinian people made its way through the school building while Jewish students were locked inside the school's library. We go now to Fox News 5's Lizette Nunez, who joins us from outside the Cooper Union in the East Village with the details. Lizette, what happened? Hey, good morning, Dan. Well, we had a chance to speak to one of the students who was inside the library. She tells us luckily the doors were locked and that helped prevent things from escalating any further. Tense moments playing out at Cooper Union during a pro-Palestinian rally yesterday. A group of Jewish students say they were locked inside the library after students involved in the demonstrations ran into the building chanting free Palestine while banging on the doors and windows. One Jewish student that was inside the library speaking to Fox 5. The banging probably lasted uh, around a minute, maybe two minutes, and you know, I, I started immediately I was I was very scared the student went on to say that they tried to call police Cooper Union tells us the library had to be closed down for about 20 minutes while protesters moved through the building they basically realized that they weren't going to get inside the library because the door was locked so they ran around to the side of the library which is a wall of windows that leads to a different hallway so we didn't just start yelling at us through these windows. Protesters eventually dispersed and the students in the library safely got out. The NYPD says no one was arrested. Cooper Union is just one of several colleges where pro-Palestinian protests took place. Several student organized walkouts were held to stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people. This was the scene as NYU students gathered in Washington Square Park. To not only call for a ceasefire, but to stop the funding of the Israeli occupying colonizing state who are killing indiscriminately Palestinian people, women and children. Others shouted from a distance showing their support for Israel. From Hamas terrorists! Over at Columbia University, a truck was parked displaying the identities and information of student organizers. Some students say they don't want to see taxpayer money go towards funding the war and would rather see the money used for something else. Money that I'm making and a job that I'm just trying to live with and pay for, you know, things like canceling student loan debt or housing for the millions and millions of homeless people in America is going to funding people being killed. And Mayor Adams also reacting to the situation. He says he has been in contact with the leaders here at the college and also with police. He also went on to say that students have a right to protest peacefully, but hate will not be tolerated in the city. That's the latest from the East Village. Dan will send things back inside. Now, what happened at Cooper Union was obviously intimidation. What were these pro-Palestinian students, why were they motivated to try to menace the Jewish students? They, these are their peers. These are people they're in class with. All of these people were students at Cooper Union, both the Jewish kids inside the library and the pro-Palestinian kids outside. What, what, what did they want? What did they want from the Jewish students? Or what did they want to do to them? What would motivate them to bang on the windows. Are, are they saying that those 20-year-old young adults with yarmulkes on were personally responsible for what Israel was doing? Whether or not Israel was doing anything good or bad? What is the motivation? Why are they going after them? <laughs> why don't we have Jew... Why don't we talk about Jewophobia? Why do we have this flaccid, anodyne term anti-Semitism. We don't have Jewophobia, though, do we? We've got Islamophobia, we got transphobia, we got femphobia, we've got, uh, what other phobias do we have? Got homophobia, but we don't have Jewphobia. Interesting. But 
what happened at Cooper Union, and this this is a corrective. This was a corrective for me. <coughs> Pardon me. And it should be a reminder to all of us to try our best. It's very hard. Try our best to keep perspective. And remember that we are being lied to and we are being shown selective portions of the truth by the media. We cannot be certain of, of anything. We have to be open to the possibility that we are being directly lied to in order to inflate our emotions. No, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not above that. It's happened to me. It's happened to people who disagree with me, people that I would fight over with this. We're in the same boat on this. Here is a spokesman for the New York Police Department um, giving his explanation for that incident at Cooper Union. Good morning. Just uh, in regards to Cooper Union, I want to get a couple of key facts right before I give you a quick, quick timeline. Uh, we were aware of the walkout protest rally at the school yesterday. School officials asked us to be there. Our police were there from start to finish. The school asked us that we would be in plain clothes, and that's a protocol that we're going to change and talk to all the schools uh, citywide about that protocol. There was no direct threats, there was no damage, and there was no danger to any students in that, in that school. Like I said, our cops are there all day, from start to finish. They were with the, the 20 protesters that were in the school. They were there at the library. The library doors, they were not, the students were not barricaded. The doors were open but closed. A school administrator thought it was prudent to close the doors and place private security as the protesters were coming down the stairs. So at approximately 1 o'clock, the protest started in front of Cooper Union. It was a walkout of students, so roughly 70 pro-Palestine, about 20 Israeli students. If you can imagine parallel to each other, uh, the Palestinian students were chanting. The Israeli students were silent. This went on for a couple hours, but what happened was people who were passing by the school, community, community people, we were getting upset with that protest and was starting to get agitated from that point of view. Around 3.30, 20 of the 70, approximately 20 of the 70 protests from the Palestinian side uh, went into the school. Now they're supposed to scan in. They are students. Let's be clear. All the, all the people here were all students part of, the, part of this institution. As the 20 kids went into the school, they're supposed to swipe in, but they kind of just rushed past the swipe in administrative error that the school is going to deal with today from school officials. From there, the 20 students want to go up to the uh, president's office, which they did. They got inside the office, the waiting area, if you will, and, and they were chanting. School officials at that time, with the police on the scene, and private security felt safe, and they wanted to allow the students to keep talking. That happened. It was going on for about a half hour. When the 20 protesters came down the stairs of Cooper Union, Another school official heard, the, heard them coming down, and that person made a decision to let's close the library doors, we'll put one over private security, and let, this, let the protesters pass. For about roughly 10 minutes, approximately 10 minutes, they were banging on the doors of the library and banging on some uh, transparent windows that you can see into the library. From that point, the protesters left. School officials thought it was important to ask the Israeli students <clears throat> Uh, do, you, do you need help getting home? Any Uber? Do you want an Uber ride? They said, no, we feel safe, we're good, and, and, and they all left. Okay. So that's a, that is a good reminder to keep, keep things in perspective, be open to new information, be willing to dial your emotions down, even if they've been riled up when you realize that you've been manipulated. Let's complicate that even a little bit more. This is a clip from Fox News. Um, her name is, she's the Newsweek opinion editor. Her name is Batya Unger Sargon. Um, picture of her tweet here. Let's just uh, roll the video. But before we roll the video, I want you, uh, especially those of you who are on audio because you won't be able to see her, she's wearing a Star of David necklace. This is a Jewish woman speaking, okay? Keep that in your mind when you hear what she has to say. 
You were also seeing students saying that they don't feel safe on campus. And to that, I have to say, um, you know, I hope they'll forgive me for saying this, but, you know, the problem with the intersectional movement is not that they didn't rank Jews high enough in the oppression Olympics. It's that they rank people based on oppression at all. And this language of safetyism, um, it's not healthy for the students to see themselves that way. I do think most of the threats are bullying, yelling, not physical in nature, although the editor of the Harvard Law Review attacked a Jewish student yesterday. We saw yeah. a video of that, but most of it is in the realm of speech. And I think that it is much more important for Jewish students to be able to defend themselves from bad ideas and bad speech than it is for them to accept this idea that they are actually unsafe. What they are unsafe, what they are in danger of is being unpopular with their peers who have adopted sociopathic views that they have been taught by their professors and that they learned on TikTok, by the way, right. because the communist, the Chinese Communist Party controls TikTok and has sided with Hamas in this conflict. And so they're learning all of this there. Um, but you know what? The Jewish students need to stand up for themselves. They need to stand up for what is right. It's okay to be unpopular with sociopaths. It's okay to be unpopular with sociopaths. God bless this woman. I'd never heard of her before. Wow. Wow. She's right. Um, she made me rethink some things. Safetyism, intersectionality. These students, all of us, all of us, we do have to stand up for ourselves. We have to be able to discern between when we are in actual danger, physical danger, somebody might kill us, somebody might kidnap our children, whatever. And when we're in danger of being shouted at or screamed at or told that we're duty heads or that we're ugly or that whatever, that's not real danger. That's social danger. And again, as this lady said, it is okay to be unpopular with sociopaths. In fact, I would say it is our moral duty. It is not the college's responsibility, and it is not the government's responsibility to mommy us into feeling safe. You want to stop the fucking bullying? Stand up for yourself. Say no. Bite back. Now, we're going to go to a break here, but I want to remind you that our schedule has changed a little bit. We are coming out a day early. You get to watch Disaffected on Saturday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern, but only on Rumble. We are rewarding Rumble for being a free speech platform that is far more open than YouTube. Of course, we still come out at 9 p.m. Uh, Eastern time on YouTube, but if you want to catch us earlier, live chat also happens, so look us up. Our channel is rumble.com slash C slash disaffected. We will see you after the break. Can't get enough of our love, baby? That's because you're not subscribed. Move that thumb over to the great big old subscribe button on your podcast app so you never miss an episode. We put out audio only exclusive content that you won't get on any other video platform, so make sure you subscribe today. Looking for a non woke place to put your money where your mouth is? Put it where my mouth is. Disaffected supporters get access to our private Discord chat server, backstage episode recording sessions, surprise guests, and more. And all it takes is $10 a month. You've got two options. Either Substack, visit us at disaffectedpod.substack.com, or go over to subscribestar.com slash disaffected. Remember, choose the $10 level or higher for Discord access. Welcome back. Tell you what. I put down smoking cigarettes 12 years ago, 
on a regular basis. I mean, I have one occasionally, but I stopped being a smoker. I vape, obviously. Um, but I've been smoking too much lately. This, this past couple weeks has got me in a state. I got to stop after this pack of lucky strikes. And I'll tell you something else. I'm not going to do it, but I want to drink really bad. If I gave in to my what I want right now, I would sit down with a tumbler and a bottle of whiskey and I would drink myself into a stupor. I have not craved alcohol this badly since I stopped drinking three years ago. So <laughs> in lieu of that, let's lighten it up a little bit up in here, shall we? All right. It's Troon time. <laughs> <laughs> Get a load of this one. Walter keeps misgendering me. Look. No. No fucking way. No way. Okay, we're gonna try this. He's he's putting AI filters on. The AI filters are misgendering him. They're making him into a male Hell character. No. Oh my god. 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 Okay, let's try again. And they say I'm histrionic. <laughs> I can't, you know, <laughs> if you're just listening, you really should hop over to one of the video channels and take a look at this young man. You got to see it. All I could think of was jam, truly outrageous, truly, truly, truly outrageous. <laughs> he looks exactly like, he looks like some chick from 1986. You know, and did you notice, who is it who pointed this out to me? One of my Twitter followers, um, and if you're watching, sir, I'm sorry, I forgot which one of you, what, I think it was Scott, um, who said, uh, who said that, that vocal affectation, he's like, look, uh, look, uh, what is that? And I was like, I don't know what that is. It's weird. I, I think actually... I think it's an expansion pack for the voice. It's, it's you know, ac extra affectation sold separately. Okay, so this guy is ridiculous, right? But w what's really going on here? This is a very pretty young man. He's a pretty boy. He's got a beautiful face. He's not a woman. He's a very pretty young man who could have had a very happy pretty boy, gay life, and a good time with his youthful beauty if he would just cut the crap. He is at the peak, he's in his physical peak, he's never gonna be this good looking again in his life. And he's ruining it, pretending to be a woman. And getting, getting upset because a computer can tell that he has male bone structure. He may be pretty, he is pretty, but he's male pretty. You know, if he would just be a pretty twink, he would fetch a macho daddy boyfriend in a heartbeat. He could have any big bruising man on his arm he wanted if he would just stop the bullshit about being a woman. And you know what? That's what he really wants. He wants a big macho boyfriend, a big bruiser to boss him around. That's what most gay men want. I know my people. Now, Let's balance the sexes and go to misgendering at the Taco Bell. Disgusting. I just went through the Taco Bell drive-thru because I'm a whore for Taco Bell. And do you know how they greeted me? They said, hello, ma'am. And then after handing me my food, said, thank you, ma'am. Have a good day. Bitch, what, what about me says ma'am? I have a fucking red mullet. What about you says, ma'am? How about the obvious fact that you're a bitchy, self-centered young female? <laughs> Get her, right? I'm bitching about going through the McDonald's drive-thru and going, welcome to McDonald's, we'll be using the app today, but first one, I'll pull up. I'm like, I'm begging, I'm begging for some civilities, just, just some basic old fashioned politeness. And this wench, is complaining because they said, have a nice day, ma'am. What is wrong with young people? And what we are, we, I have a red mullet. Well, you know, sucks to be you. 
number one. But number two, what women aren't allowed to have mullets that you think that that's a gender marker. <laughs> this is what I mean. This is actually it's a perfect example of what I mean when I say that young people today literally. And I mean that in the proper sense of the term. They literally do not know and don't believe that a world existed before they were born. I was there. Women wore mullets in the 80s. Men wore them more, but women did. A lot of dykes did. But even straight women wore mullets in the 80s. It was never a good look. It's not a good look on you now. Um, but this is how disconnected they are. She thinks, well, I'm wearing... I'm wearing a mullet, so why would they ma'am me? You know what she is? She is, it is not ma'am. <laughs> All right. Um, my friend Holly, who writes a substack, Holly the Math Nerd, you should definitely subscribe to it. She has a, a really great article out on gift giving. And she is the best gift chooser I have ever seen. Um, and Holly, I know you're watching um, and you're, you know, as as one is wont to do, you like to check your self evaluation against outside feedback. I affirm you. I validate you that you are, in fact, as clever and good a gift giver as you think you are. So she's got an article out called Inaugurating the Season of Hope, plus how to do a great job choosing presents. And it's a it's a guide for everybody who has a budget of zero dollars all the way up to lots of disposable income to spend, if you have a hard time choosing gifts for somebody, if you follow Holly's method, you're going to come up with something great, uh, really worthwhile. Um, and I'm going to give you the proof, the proof of the pudding. We're going to do the eating now, OK? The housewarming present that Holly just gave me is the single best gift anyone has ever given me. And I've had some very good gifts. There are a couple from my close friends, George and Clay, that are like neck and neck with this. I mean, in fact, I shouldn't have mentioned anybody's name because now everybody's going to be upset with me. I love they, they're all good gift givers. This one, this one puts it right over the top. As you know, I have a complicated <laughs> relationship with Joan Crawford. <laughs> She's my dark muse. What you're seeing on your screen, for years, I have wanted a piece of authentic Joan Crawford memorabilia touched by her own hands, one of her possessions. Um, I once nearly brought a hairbrush set that she had. Uh, then I almost bought a pair of her ankle strap pumps. Um, but I couldn't justify the frivolous expense because I am, in fact, a very cheap, stingy Yankee. This that you are seeing is an autographed black and white photo, hand retouched in color, inscribed by Joan Crawford to Maybelline Cosmetics. I will read you the inscription. <clears throat> to Maybelline, the eye makeup I would never be without. Sincerely, Joan Crawford. Oh. It's so good. It's so good. And it's, it's big, too. What you can't see there, it, this, 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 the, the picture itself is about this big, and there's this gorgeous wooden frame that it's been matted into with a glass front. So, And I'll tell you, crazy as she was, as with all things fashion, Joan Crawford was right. This Maybelline Great Lash Mascara. It is the best stuff in the world. Yes. Yes, I wear it, just for the show. It, what she does is <laughs> you wipe the wand almost completely dry. You want to get almost all that goop off there. And then you just you just bump it. You bump it against the ends of your eyelash. You just want to put teeny, teeny, tiny little bit of color on there just to make your eyes stand out a little bit more. Um, and my, um, my apartment, I've moved into the house um, that was flooded, and it's almost renovated. It's not all the way put back together, but I'm getting ready to unpack and decorate, and that Crawford portrait is going to go up on the wall next to my actual heirloom family portraits from the 1890s, and I'll put a couple of uh, swing arm bracket, uh, wrought iron kerosene lamp um, swing arms uh, to make it, to give it beauty lighting, um, because really, 
Every good boy should hang a picture of his mother, shouldn't he? <laughs> and now a white pill to take us out of the show. A little bit of hope. This Twitter exchange gave me hope. It's the distillation of what we have been trying to do here on Disaffected. I got to watch someone in real time have the light bulb moment that I want everybody to have. So I wrote on Twitter, misgendering isn't real because trans isn't real. It's time for all of us to stop indulging this. Being nice is actually us being scared. And by being scared, we are doing what narcissists want. We are emboldening them. And among the replies that I got was this one from Chico. I think she, yeah, I think it's she. You can't tell anymore these days. <laughs> Chico says, I finally get it. This social BS attracts and enables narcissists because we are not allowed to tell them no. It all goes poof if we say no. Yes. Yes. It all goes poof if you say no. That's the answer. This is, this is the wizard at the end of The Wizard of Oz telling Dorothy that she always had the power to go back home to Kansas. She just didn't know it. And now that she knows it and now she believes in herself, she can go home. It's the same thing. So I wrote, this is the whole answer right here. There's nothing else. This is all it is. This is the answer that people are always asking me for. Say no. Hold boundaries. Tell the truth. Don't let them. That's the entire solution. Now go forth and say no. And Chico responded. This is what I didn't get for so long. The trans movement is sexist. The DEI movement is racist. The science is unscientific. Don't you people see? Arguing with lunatics. Just say no, then walk away. Yes. Thank you, Chico. Good night. We'll see you next week.